Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of the Rumcast. We are the podcast that talks all things rum related with the people who love and shape it. My name is John Gullah and mixing it up with me as always is Will Hookinga in Tennessee. And on today's episode is our feature interview with rum author and ambassador Shannon Mustafer. But before we get to talking with Shannon and finding out about all the things that she's been up to as of late, Will, uh, you and I recently met up at Miami Rum Congress and uh, you you invaded my home turf here uh, as, it, as it is. And um, so now I think that's that was a couple of weeks ago. We've had some mm-hmm. time to think back on it. And I thought it might be fun for us to open our episode today to discuss our experience a little bit. Yeah, I think um, I had a great time in Miami. Um, Honestly, the coolest part was just getting to spend time with, you know, rum people. People, I mean, we ran into several guests from the show who were there. Mm -hmm. It was great to reconnect with them. Uh, Some of them, like, I don't think we'd met in person before. So that was really cool. Yeah. And also getting to meet a bunch of Rumcast listeners in person. It was really cool. I mean, we, we had conversations with... Uh, I don't know, maybe like a dozen people who listen to the show, and it was just great to to get to hang out and share a drink with some of them. Um, and yeah, the event it's, itself, we got to try uh, a bunch of great rum. It's, mm-hmm. I, I think we're we're going to record a, a bonus episode for our Patreon subscribers this month um, that goes a little bit more into detail in terms of like the specific rums and things. But um, one of the things that you know, I know I'm going to spend some time talking about was I think like the overwhelming majority of the rums that stood out to me the most were cane juice rums. Yeah. Uh, so that, um, that was something I, I, you know, made an impression on me for sure. But what I about can you? see that. Well, I also think that might be where we gravitated towards because, you know, the, the event itself had quite a bit of um, different people there, including different heritages of rums. Mm-hmm. But I think we're probably more familiar with some of the, the molasses rums. And right. so it's, you know, th- there's that where I think there was, to your point, a little bit more uh, newer to market agricole stuff. Mm-hmm. And maybe that also helped with shaping that experience. But I, also- I agree with you. Yeah. Also some stuff like I know St. James was there and they had mm-hmm. some some of the stuff that they brought was like Europe only releases. So that yeah. you know aren't in our market anyway. So mm-hmm. like I said, we're gonna get into those in a little bit more detail in our bonus episode. But yeah, that's that's kind of what stood out to me the most. Yeah. And I actually thought about this a little bit uh, in terms of like, what am I looking for out of a rum event? And mm. I came up with like three reasons of why I want to go. Okay. And then uh, this those... is like to any rum event in general. Yes, to any rum event in general. One mm-hmm. is to try new rums and things I haven't tried before. Right, mm-hmm. that obviously makes you know helps with informing future purchases and just you know learning more about that. And two is to learn about things that you can't already like learn through their website or just mm-hmm. talk to people who are the decision makers uh, and and are there to you can just interact with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then and then three is you know to talk with like minded folks like like us right uh so people who are there as rum lovers and you just have a good time with them so i I was thinking about it maybe i was gonna ask you Mm -hmm. is if you had to think of like what does the perfect rum event look like for you Mm -hmm. is there uh what if we put it in like to a recipe format Mm -hmm. so okay if you had a cocktail yeah if you had to make a recipe for the perfect rum event okay what would that be well, I love how, you know, topical this is with our, our guest on this episode. So um, nicely done with, with how you framed this up. I uh, think well, um, I try if I'm going to think of like the, the recipe, um, the first place my mind goes is to just structure something based on like the classic daiquiri recipe. OK, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking like two parts and then three quarters parts and then either three quarters parts or like one half if you're using like you know like a rich syrup um Mm -hmm. like i know you like to do it in your daiquiris i do um Mm -hmm. so i would say just like with a daiquiri how it's two parts rum um i want two parts to be just about trying different rums so you know i want the emphasis of the event to be on the liquid itself like education and stuff like that is cool um and obviously like a through line of the whole thing is getting to, you know, hang out with with uh, other rum enthusiasts. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. just kind of, you know, 
goes without saying. But I would say two parts, the rum itself. So I want lots of different brands present there. I want to be able to try stuff that I, you know, is is harder to access or maybe is newer and that sort of thing. The three quarters part, I will say I would like it to be rum focused education. So this would be things like presentations about um, you know, rum production itself or styles of rum, or maybe even things having to do with with cocktails, you know, getting the bar world involved there, the stuff that's very focused on rum itself. And then the last part, I'll say I'll do a half part of of, of um, richly constructed industry focused education, oh, because like, okay. I think, um, I think Miami Rum Congress, I think the the kind of event programming was was um mostly like industry focused stuff, which I think right. is good. Like, like I the thought seminars. it was interesting mm-hmm. and, and that's mm-hmm. how it's you know marketed and everything. So mm-hmm. um but I like I would love I like I I like all that stuff. I just want like it to be like a, a like a little more condensed section of the of the whole selection of stuff. So that's why I'm saying like it's a half part, but it's like it's uh, it's like the two to one ratio syrup, you know, it's like yeah. heavily concentrated, like the stuff that's packed in there really <laughs> delivers. Um, so that's how I think about it. Two parts just about rum and trying yeah. rums and going up and like talking to the producer as you try their rums. Three quarters parts rum focused education, half part industry focused education. That's how I'm thinking about it. What about you? Uh, well, first of all, I love how much thought you put into that. Uh, <laughs> hey, I was, uh, you give me a you give me a prompt. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm going to I'm going to go all the way. with Good. It. Good. Well, well, well done. Um, I think, you know, it's got to be so difficult as a person putting on an event to try to cater to all these different people, like you mentioned, industry focus and then other people. And, and I think that Miami Rum Congress was able to do that. When I was starting to think about this, that's partly what prompted my thought process was like, how would I want this event for me? But I also want it to be a successful event for everyone, mm-hmm. which is a really hard thing to do. Um, but so I, I'm going to be honest, I use the DAC model as well. Okay. But since you I did mean, it, I don't want to copy you now. So I'm going to I'm going to on the fly here move oh, to wow. a different one and we're going to go with more of like a rum old fashioned model here. Oh, interesting. And so like you, I'm going to use rum as the base. You pretty much stated it well as I would state it, which is it's really important to nail the rums that are going to be there and mm-hmm. the the right mix of those is incredibly important. Just like picking the right rum for your mm-hmm. rum old fashioned would be really important to what your end drink is going to be. So that that has to be the focus, right? But I will say in a rum old fashioned, you know what, what really does get me going with a rum old fashioned? If it has the right ice cube and it has the right oh, glass. Oh, yeah. The ice cube is huge. Yeah. You it's a huge be, deal. You can't just be getting like the the cubes out of the freezer, you know, tray or whatever that are all cloudy and that, that totally yep. ruins the experience. And I know because I've done that at home on many <laughs> occasions because I'm too lazy to make it right. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh. But so I would liken that to the venue itself, right? The okay. the, the the venue wow, that the, you're putting the venue on. is the ice. Well, in a way, I think the venue is the glass. Oh, more wow. maybe than the ice, but it's also about the structure, as you mentioned, right? I didn't even so think about the venue. I like how you're yeah. you're you're bringing different uh, variables to this than I did. Yeah. Well, you mentioned all the things that struck you from Miami on Miami Beach, and that's mm-hmm. just one small part of Miami. There's a lot of different places in Miami that can be very different, but that vibe was part of the event, right? So mm-hmm. it's where are you doing this event? What what city? What part of the city? And what place specifically, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can have a a place that's kind of slightly too small, and then it's crowded and noisy you can have a place that's slightly too large and then it might look empty and Mm -hmm. so all of that's really important i think to thinking about your end model and how you're you're making that work the last piece which i'll go back to the rum old fashioned kind of uh thing for is um it's i think i'm going back and forth in my head here with this it's the the syrup that you're going to use the sugar the added sugar is Uh the education okay Okay. And the bitters, I told you I was doing this on the fly and I, yeah. I'm not lying. And the bitters is kind of, I want to say fun. Okay. So and it's kind of the seasoning, the spice. Exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. So you, you have to have, in my opinion, I say you have to have, but I have to have fun at an mm-hmm. event like this. I do this because I love rum. I love learning about it. And mm-hmm. that's part of the fun. But also, I just want to have fun. Right. So like, yeah. how are you making your event both educational and fun? Mm-hmm. And that would be the right marriage to me of what I'm looking for in an event. It has to be the right place, has to be the right size, the right rums, and then that mix of education and fun that brings it all together. 
That's pretty good. I mean, we're we're giving everyone the recipe right here for uh, <laughs> for free. There you go. The perfect rum event. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, aspiring event planners out there, you've you've got everything you need now. <laughs> Run with uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, I think we can probably transition over into our interview for this episode. Really great conversation with. Shannon Mustafer. Uh, I think a lot of listeners will maybe be familiar with her book, Tiki Modern Tropical Cocktails, which came out in 2019, I believe. Um, so great cocktail book. Her background, she got into rum, I believe, around 2014, designed the bar program at a restaurant in New York called Gladys uh, Caribbean rum focus menu. And that kind of started kicked off her you know, deep dive into rum mm -hmm. journey. And since then, she's gone on to, you know, design a lot of other bar programs. She's doing a lot of consulting now, but she's, uh, we describe her in the intro as kind of a, a champion for the rum category. And so I think, I think for us, one thing we want to do this year is, is get a, a few more, you know, uh, personalities from the world of, of cocktails, bars, things like that on the show. I know yeah. we always talk about we're, we're both a little more into neat drinking, but we both enjoy cocktails and it's mm -hmm. a big part of the category. And so I think for me, getting to learn about Shannon's kind of creative process, how she thinks about rums and cocktails um, and, you know, combining them with other things. Uh, she has a really kind of interesting approach to how she does that. We also got into like the, the geeky stuff, like how you name a cocktail. That was really fun to me yeah, to talk about. And um, also, you know, a little bit of strategic stuff, you know, how to go about using Jamaican overproofs the right way, how to know which one to use. So a lot of different topics, but uh, a, a, a great time. And I learned a lot that, you know, I'll try to apply a little bit to my own home cocktail making. Yeah, she's a fun person and her expertise of it uh, clearly comes through. And I thought it was an interesting part to talk about the split base as well. And yeah, how she, mm -hmm. she had kind of engineered that as part of modernizing cocktails, um, which was a fun part of the conversation as well. So And not just um, split base with rum, but like multi-spirit right. split base, yeah. like rum, mezcal, stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was great. And, uh, you know, as always, we hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. And we'll uh, get right to it. We are here with Shannon Mustafer, spirits educator, cocktail consultant. You may know her as the author of the 2019 book, Tiki Modern Tropical Cocktails. One of, I think, the best champions for rum we have out there right now. So welcome to the show, Shannon. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. And uh, I like to think I'm a rum champion, but I've noticed a few folks popping up in the past year that are doing an awesome job with that, too. So it, it's just I feel like I'm in good company. Right yeah, now. for sure. No, there's there's uh, there are there is a variety of awesome voices out there. I like that title though, Rum Champion. I think mm -hmm. that's fitting. Um, Definitely in the pantheon for sure. <laughs> rum champions. Yes, the pantheon of rum champions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I know I, I was thinking about um, you know your book came out in 2019. That was only four years ago. Actually, according to the publication date that I checked on Amazon before this, we're like a month away from the four year anniversary of publishing the book and it's a pretty insane four-year stretch since then like a lot happened you know um mm. so I kind of wanted to start with just what's been going on for you since the book was published I know obviously when you publish a book and I know you know yours has been through multiple printings um award-winning um so very successful book I know that in and of itself is is nice but when I've talked to people who publish books I know also just like having a book that it has that kind of success, can open lots of doors, create lots of new opportunities and things like that. So what are some things that, that you've been doing uh, over the past few years that, you know, really have you excited? Yeah, I mean, when the book came out, it was actually uh, um, delayed by a year because oh, no the way. publisher um, in the process of undergoing an acquisition. And so they mm. were changing ownership so that the release back but I think it was good because um when I started working on it in 2016 there really wasn't much of a, a market or appetite for Robert Tiki cocktails mm. and so I think the delay actually served us in that by the time the book came out 
there is at least one tiki bar in every major U.S. Okay. city. And also secondary markets. I hate using that term because I think it's all relative. Yeah, yeah. We're also see uh, tiki and run bars um, come to prominence. And so it was just like there was more of an audience for it. And it, as you alluded to, it opened up so many doors because I think people were excited to see um, a new voice on tiki and rum, whereas mm -hmm. right, it had kind of been, uh, you know, dominated by a few figures like right. Jack Beach from me and um, Martin Kate, mm -hmm. you know, great guys. But I think people were really like, oh, wow, a woman wrote this book, a person right. of color wrote this book. And this is like not what we were expecting. But mm -hmm. it, you know, on one hand, you know, definitely acknowledges tradition, but also kind of points uh, to different ways to look at the genre. I think people were really excited about that. And so subsequently, you know, I've been able to um, make a living as a consultant and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm no longer attached to a bar program. Uh, right. The bars were mm -hmm. with prior to the pandemic, unfortunately shuttered. I know, but yeah, yeah. You know, I've been able to do at least like two programs a year, give or take. And uh, there's one coming up that I'm really excited about. It's uh, a rum bar in Brooklyn. And Ooh. the owner already has a rum bar and I helped her work on two years ago. But this one is going to be like 2.0 with like oh, a nice. sick back wheel, proprietary pours, um, private barrels and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. Um, I've been consulting, giving seminars like this afternoon. I'm in Miami to present to Tiki by the Sea Alumni Weekend. And I've also been able to work on some product creation. Yeah. So um, I have a realness coming out. No way. Um, with Ooh, cool. What? Yeah. Very limited allocation, a uh, little under a thousand liters initially. Uh, it's called Tiki Blend. Uh, their first expression is cash drink. It came out in 2020 and uh, went double gold in San Francisco. This one is proofed a little lower and meant to be more cocktail friendly. And uh, yeah, we started working on it two years ago. Uh, the first shipment just arrived in New York this past Friday. And uh, when I look back on uh, the process of creating that blend, I realized that um, it's basically what I always wanted Smith and Cross to be. Like Smith and Cross is like my gateway drug uh -huh. in the realm. Right, right, right. I didn't mm -hmm. reach that high. And I always loved having old fashions with Smith and Cross. And I didn't know why I liked it that much. And then later I was like, it's it's higher proof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that helps. You know, <laughs> yeah. But the story of taking pot still Jamaica rum and blending it in proportions that recall the earliest experiences that people had with aged rums. It's something I've always resonated with. And uh, the Myrtle Bay Tiki blend, I think, is my opinion on what that style of Jamaica rum is. Mm as it pertains to like the early stages of mixology in the 1920s. Okay. Yeah. Wow. What? Uh, Good. Yeah. I was just going to say, what was the, like how many iterations did you go through to arrive at that final blend? Um, and it's so interesting just to think because, you know, I've, I've read a lot about your approach to creating cocktails and things like that, but, you know, creating a spirit, do you approach it? What, what what do you look for in terms of what you're creating? And I, I'm imagining, are you are you thinking about how this will be used in the bar? I'm guessing you bring that to it, but I'm just kind of curious about what your creative process was like for, okay, I'm going to do a rum. What are steps one through five, you know? Well, thankfully, we had some, some good liquids to work with, you mm. know, that had already been established prior. So, yeah. you know, um, Myrtle Bank, it's not a distiller. They're a merchant lender mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, they work with Skier and Main Rub Company out of London. So mm -hmm. um, they were able to give me some samples to play with that were pretty good to begin with. I didn't really have to 
give a ton of input apart mm-hmm. from saying, I like this one, I like that one, I like this one. And I think that they're pretty good they, at what they do over there. Yeah. 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 So the, the work was pretty much done. I want to acknowledge that. Um, but it was more about me pinpointing what I think is special about pot distilled Jamaica rounds mm-hmm. that I didn't see represented in a market currently and uh, coming up with a bottling that would capture that. So um, in regards to my creative process, I like to kind of think like a chef, right? Where the the last bite should leave you wanting more, mm. right? Like it's one thing to make something that tastes delicious off the bat, but to keep you engaged throughout the tasting experience and then to have you feel more satisfied at the very end is the goal, mm-hmm. right? If you're a good chef. And I, I kind of treat cocktails as well as spears the same way where I'm looking forward to beginning the middle and the end, the journey, right? Like I've, I've sampled spirits where the nose is really good, but then it just falls off and I'm like, I feel stranded. <laughs> I'm like, what happened? Like, I feel catfish because not, <laughs> I feel like get X and then I just got left on the side of the road. Like, where did you go? You know what I'm saying? So you I'm betrayed me, to, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm for that. You know, the nose that's going to signal what you're going to experience in the palate. And then the finish that lingers and kind of leaves you curious about like, well, what just happened here? I want to go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's a lot more I know know we want to dig into with like your love of Jamaican rum and creating mixed drinks and cocktails. But before we get too far away from the book, I also wanted to ask, you mentioned you would start thinking about this, uh, the book in 2016. So I was curious to know then, did you have an initial aha moment or inspiration thinking about when you wanted to do this? Or was there something that you said, this is the reason I have to write this book? Well, I'd like to say the devil made me do it. Um, (laughs) The best origin story. Yeah. No effects is the gentleman that shot the book. And I met him through a mutual friend slash colleague, Nicole Taylor. Um, She had just published her book. Uh, He shot it and she invited him to my birthday party. And this is like maybe in 2015 after Gladys had been open for maybe a year. Um, And at that time, he was seeking opportunities to shoot drinks to kind Mm -hmm. of add that to his portfolio and, Mm -hmm. you know, and what he could do for work. And so... um, it's it's really funny. Nicole is hysterical. She predicted that we would, you know, clasp hands and, you know, ride off the sunset together. But she's like, you guys are going to love each other. Right. And well, after that meeting at my birthday, he's like, hey, I want to do a test shoot. And I was like, great, let's do it. And it went really well. Image just looked great. His um, agent loved it. And at the time, he had just finished um art of the cheese plate oh cool by T. and uh and the visuals of the book were a bit of a departure for Rizzoli and a little edgy and funky and they loved it and it worked it was selling really well mm-hmm. and so he thought well i think we can probably do a tiki book because they want like some younger fresh energy right 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 that. So it was his funky, idea. Funky works with cheese. It works with rum too. So yeah. Yeah. Um, it was his idea. I wasn't thinking about writing a book because I was like up to here, you know, <laughs> writing a, my first bond. <laughs> and so when he was like, you want to do this? I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> because I studied painting and art history in undergrad. Oh, cool. And right. I was still in the worked for a paper department of the Risty Museum following graduation and also worked in their library handling rare books. Oh, that's and super so, cool. Ooh, we need to so talk about they, that later too. Yes. I'm a rare books they, fan. <laughs> all these like the best publishers in my mind in regards yeah. to what they featured as well as how they made their books. And so it's like, yes, of course. Of course. Cool. But 
I mean, it seems like it's like timing again for you. It's like the, everything was kind of hitting at the right time for you with all of this. So that's that's super cool. You can't say no to something like that, right? I'm sure even though you were like, oh, I'm busy, but like, how do I say no to this opportunity? Um, yeah. And yeah, the, the yeah. photos in the book are fantastic, by the way. Yeah. So um, sh- shout out to Noah as well for for those. But um, and the, the point you made earlier about the timing, I, I actually think I think 2018 was you were talking about, you know, tiki bars in secondary cities. Nashville, I'm in Nashville. It's probably considered a secondary city. Um, and that's like right when I think both Chopper and Pearl Diver like opened right around the same year. And those were like the first tiki bars here. So, yeah, the timing is super interesting. Yeah. Um, there was also I, so I wanted to dig into a little bit. Uh, I saw a headline that said, quote, Shannon Mustafer is here to modernize tiki cocktails. So first of all, bold title, right? Uh, got me. And then I, I was asked, I was asking myself, and now I want to ask you is, what does it mean to modernize a tiki cocktail? And can you maybe go through that and give us some examples of it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I always look to Don Beachcomber as an exemplar of um, how to build a drink template and how to be a little no holds barred about it. And so whenever I'm thinking about a drink, I'm like, well, what would Don do? You know, almost like what would Jesus do? Right. You need the little you bracelet. Yeah. Messing up the letters. Or maybe a hat. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that if Don had access to agave the way we do now, why not? And I think like one of the triggers to pursue that path was um, I wanted to make a Mai Tai Rick, you know, that the uh, Trader Vic drink. Mm-hmm. And uh, I blended mezcal and rum mm-hmm. in this tablet. And I call it Strangers in Paradise. Mm-hmm. And it was like the first time that I considered that a tropical drink didn't have to consist of rum primarily. Like you could basically use whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And as long as you have, you know, um, <laughs> balance to layers and mm-hmm. a nerdy that can kind of like surprise you. Yeah. I, I mm-hmm. think that mm-hmm. when you drink the element of surprise is like the big thing right because you get either like this elaborately garnished and presented thing and it looks a certain way and then you taste it and it's not what you thought it was going to be but you still like it like i think that that's really the guiding principle behind making a good tiki drink and so by modernizing it it was more about just bringing in ingredients that i'm certain uh donna beach color would have utilized if it was available right mm-hmm. so yeah that as well as you know using modern techniques you know like sous vide mm-hmm. um, sat washing basically using all the tools in the modern bar to just like pack as much flavor and use quote-unquote unusual juxtapositions mm. where you know reading the words in the page and right necessity <laughs> huh? yeah. yeah yeah and then i show you what it's doing here you know so it's yeah. like i didn't know you could do that and it's like yes you can yeah those, i read you oh sorry go ahead. no I, I was just gonna say those are the drink like uh you know as a cus like a bar customer when i go to bars those are the drinks that i gravitate to that i want to order where it's like i never would have thought to combine these this is something i wouldn't make at home you know um and so yeah I, I love going out and seeing stuff like that yeah i was gonna say i read your article on split based cocktails actually i'm i'm not as much of a cocktail person i'm more of a rum neat drinker but uh, as will knows and and people who listen but i like to uh try to experiment a little bit and then of course anytime as will's saying i get to go to a place that serves drinks like that i love to try to partake so i can experience that uh with what I definitely cannot accomplish at home, you even if I had most of this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that article on split based cocktails, uh, like what you were talking about, mixing the a mezcal and a rum agricole together seems fantastic and something that I personally haven't experienced at all yet. Um, I was going to ask if you could follow that up by talking a little bit more about how you explore using a split base. And maybe sometimes when you know you shouldn't be doing that in certain drinks, which I have no idea how you would determine. Well, 
you know, the, the split base, you know, there are a few examples outside of Tiki. Um, you know, we're talking about like punches primarily. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe you'll see things like cognac and gin or cognac and rum. And mm-hmm. the notion there is that one of the spirits is kind of like providing the foundation and the other spirit is providing like the accents, right? Mm-hmm. Be it the world down to finish or something like that. And you basically just try to put something together that one spirit can provide. Um, mm-hmm. Especially as it pertains to how those spirits um, support or amplify the other ingredients in the serve, right? And so, in the case of tiki, uh, you know, Don Beach made this case that, you know, where one rope can do, three can do better, right? Mm-hmm. Because he really realized yeah. that um, everything is basically a component. And one of the things that I've been kind of thinking about of late is that when people look at our bottle of rum, they think it's one liquid, but it's all components. Mm-hmm. Um, most part, it's, it's probably a blend of pot and column still at minimal. And mm-hmm. then you have different ages of liquid in the bottle. Mm-hmm. So it's like people think it's like a liquid, but it's like, no, it's multiple liquids in one bottle and you don't really see that so much in other spirit categories so that's kind of like inherent to run in general mm-hmm. yeah and so having that insight where you realized that it's just parts and you want to balance the parts and put them together it's something that i always think about and i think what realm is like a category where you can have the different components in one bottle or you can put different bottles together. It gives hmm. me so much flexibility as the mixologist. Like, yeah. can we do that with gin? Can't we really do that with whiskey? Can't really do that with agave. But with rum, you can just, I mean, I like to think of myself as like the clumsiest great soul person I know, kind of like the Swedish <laughs> chef. <I'm old>. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like you can fly all over the place. Yeah, just right. like, yeah, flavor ingredients, yay! We've got anyway, to do that I video. Just... There, that's a, a an upcoming YouTube video, Shannon. We got to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it, if it were like um a comic, it would just be like the cloud of dust and like yes, motion yeah. lines everywhere. You know, with like four different arms coming out. Yeah, bottles <laughs> in the air at that time. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Um, you know, you you were talking there about working with a split plate split split base one of the spirits kind of serving as the foundation and i've heard you in talking about your approach to making cocktails um and correct me if i'm wrong but i I think what i recall hearing is that you typically start with the base spirit and and sort of build off of that um but one thing i was interested in particularly with tiki drinks which have a reputation as you know being complex having a lot of ingredients um, which your book, bur- your book certainly, you know, dispels the notion that they always need to have 12 ingredients like a zombie and that kind of thing. But h- how do you know when a-, a cocktail is, is done? Um, are you just kind of going all on your own taste? Do you bring in other people and like get their opinions? Are you trying it out on a menu and seeing how people respond? When do you kind of know, okay, like, I don't need to tweak this anymore. It- it's good. All the components are there. It depends. Um, I typically can get it in about five or six passes. Okay. Hmm. And I usually involve other people, you know, be it a client or in the case of my book, when I was like in the last phase of mm-hmm. testing the last piece, I had, you know, friends who were bartenders, friends who were lay people mm-hmm. come in. You know, we had like, taste things a couple times mm-hmm. a week because I didn't think that it, it, just because I liked it meant it was good. I needed, you know, other feedback and how that was coming across because, you know, I have my palate, mm-hmm. but there's like a range of palettes out there. And I was trying yeah. to find um, something that could appeal 
to as many people as possible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, there's so many things that go into a successful cocktail, right? It's not just the recipe or the ingredients. It's like the appearance, the glassware, the garnish. Uh-huh, for that sure. Is so there's always like this, this kind of like revision process around like, maybe I should, maybe it should be on ice. Maybe it shouldn't be on ice. Maybe I need to change the ice. Mm-hmm. Things of that nature. I, I always love, and you've, you've made connections between uh, cocktail making and music. Your, your book has a, a section mm-hmm. on music at the end, which is really cool. Um, and one thing I love when talking to musicians um, or, you know, bands that I like is hearing a story about a song that took a particularly like long time or many revisions to like finally get it where it clicked. Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Were there any drinks in, in the book that, that stand out to you as like, that was the one that like, I couldn't get for the longest time. And then like, you know, on like the 10th revision or whatever, it finally came together. Was there one that was like harder to get to the finish line than other ones that stands out to you? Well, there's a drink that didn't make it to the book for that reason. Oh, the oh bo- like it's a bonus unfinished. Track. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for like almost a decade. No way. Wow. Yeah. And I think that I just can't, I can't do it because the product isn't available. You know, there, oh. there's some like messy cocktail books and it's like, yeah, there's no America con. I can't make it straight, really. Mm, yeah. And I think not a cocktail like that. And so this one, it's around that head. Okay. Sounds good. And mm-hmm. With a on Smith and Cross and Chenar. Mm-hmm. But this is a red label. And now we have Chenar 70. Right, right, right. More vermouth and different rums, but I still have it sound the right ingredients for this cocktail. Okay. And I really mm-hmm. will make it. And there's you there's know, there's so many vermouths out there too. So I, I feel like um are, were you saying you're including vermouth or is Chenar kind of like taking the full place? Uh vermouth and chinar. Because okay. I included that like there's no way I can like make this with vermouth because the the rub is just gonna trample it down. Mm-hmm, but I think mm-hmm. it's a little more substantial to make it happen. But I mean I remember trying to put an El Presidente on the opening menu at Gladys. But this was before House of Pens had released their Vermouth de Comos, mm. which is actually the Vermouth that's um, historically identified with that drink. And so I was like trying to do like, you know, switch of uh, dry and white Vermouth. It wasn't working. Mm. The product was there. So, yeah, I need to figure out that rum Manhattan. That's, uh, yeah. Well, maybe we can we can crowdsource some some ideas <laughs> and stuff from, from this interview but um that's an interesting note on the el presidente because i've tried to make el presidentes at home and i mean i'm, I'm not a great cocktail maker in the first place yeah you're, you're signaling like the no 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 yeah. and i've never had one where i've been <laughs> like right like, where can i get this drink to taste good yeah this yeah sucks. Yeah, because it, so- it sounds like a drink I would love and I make it and I'm just like, this has to be me. But the the fact that that, that you have struggled with it as well makes me feel a lot better about myself. So. Well, <laughs> not you. Um, following on that note, one of my favorite components of cocktails um, is the name. And I think your book has a lot of really cool names. We were talking about this before we started recording. Um, like you've got uh, Kingston Sound System, Death Valley at Sunset, Infernal Triangle. There are there like your names are very evocative. Um, yeah. And and I wanted to know, like, do you have a certain approach to naming, or or does it sort of happen naturally along the way? Well, I, you know, I like that you did mention the process that musicians go through to, you know, create a track. And when I'm coming up with a cocktail bag. I I want it to, you know, get you curious about what's going to take place, mm. or even like just make you laugh or smile mm-hmm. to kind of talk more. It's like, oh, that's funny. Okay, I want to try that. Right. You know, I want to engage you with whatever imagery is going to come up with their name, and maybe get the drink, and maybe it conforms to the image, or maybe it kind of like deviates a, a touch. Or kind of like taste yourself where you didn't expect to go. And that's a part of engaging. So 
the name and the name just kind of like gets the wheels turning mm -hmm. and gets you engaged and then we yeah. bring you in. It's like have a different you, part of your brain almost in a way that it's engaging. Yeah. Have you ever thought of a name first and been like, I need to make a cocktail that fits that? Or is that just kind of like a totally backwards process? No, I typically start with a name because... Oh, you do? Interesting. We start with a name and then try to figure Ooh. out, you know, what kind of um, sensorial experience is going to... Um, go with that or, uh -huh. you know, align with it. But yeah, usually such a name because that's what you see first. You know, you see it's the true. name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to decide probably based on that or the ingredients. But, you know, I, I need the name to kind of like hook you and bring right. you in. So does, uh, does your unfinished rum Manhattan cocktail, does it already have a name you know you're going to use? Or is that, no, it's still TBD? Maybe that's part of the problem. <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's it. Maybe we solved it. You just, you need the name. Yeah. A decade in Manhattan. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we, we talked about, you mentioned your, you have a Jamaican rum coming out soon, which is super exciting. Uh, I know you're a huge fan of Jamaican rums. Uh, John and I obviously big fans of oh, Jamaican yeah. rums as well. And we talk often on the show about uh, the holy trinity of Jamaican overproofs, Ray and Nephew, Rum Fire, and Rum Bar. Um, I should probably, maybe Trinity is too limiting because Monty Musk has a good overproof as well. So, mm -hmm. but one thing I wanted to ask was when it comes to those, you know, iconic Jamaican overproof rums, how do I decide which one to use if I'm making a drink that I know I'm going to use a Jamaican overproof in? Like, do you have certain preferences in terms of like if it's if the drink has th these flavors i know ray and nephew is going to be better than rum fire or like how, how do you look at that well for cocktail serves that have more than three ingredients i have a tendency to go with rum fire because i like the texture mm. and i think it pairs really well with banana pineapple things that are a little more like kind of voluminous Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to it right next to you like I prefer to kind of like I'd be using this like salt pepper in another you know with another run or something simple like a a ray of tea mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah. it's more the same way but with red bar it's more like high balls with ray nephew it's more like modifier and then with rock fire it can actually be a base because it mm. has a lot of texture to it. Yeah, it's mm. thick. It's thick for sure. Um, are, are there any rubs that you have found to like, like which present the biggest challenge when it comes to incorporating them into a cocktail? And it doesn't necessarily have to be specific bottles. It could be like styles. Um, are there some that are just harder to figure out than others to you? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, Spanish out rums. Mm hmm can be difficult for me and again i mean they're very kind of different from jamaica rooms which is um, what i prefer for my palate um and it's only in the last six months that i've been able to kind of dispel the notion that they're all sweet or all adulterated right yeah you know, yeah. You know a seminar with um ron Zacapa and also did a deep dive into Del Splateros and mm -hmm. the impression that those rums are sweetened, they're not. They're just, they're Solaris style rums that have basically been moving to barrels, you know, for 20 plus years and the barrels and the liquids themselves are just kind of polishing each other and kind of giving it this like the sheen that I thought was sugar. It's not. It's just the liquid has been able to kind of mellow out in a way that makes it great on its own. I don't know how to mix with those rooms. I would like to figure it out mm -hmm. because I think the best way to get people to enjoy a rum is to put it in a cocktail. But sweeter liquids are difficult for me because right. I have drier palate. Um, and the way that the Spanish style rums tend to get proofed are a little lower. Again, not my preference. Like yeah. when it comes to I prefer 
50% ABV and above, because I think it just like punches through the build. Mm-hmm. So Spanish hour is kind of like my, my final frontier. And I never wanted to like hate on it altogether because. It's a huge category, you know, right? Well, it's a mm-hmm. huge category. And it's also one of more accessible categories for most consumers initially. Yeah. You know, you know, like Bacardi, were not for them, I don't think that there would have been much going on with rum cocktails during Prohibition and subsequently during Tiki. You know, I, I think, you know. I mean, they were synonymous I, with rum for a long time. Like, you didn't ask for rum, you asked for B- Bacardi, right? Right, like, there's yeah. There's plenty mm-hmm. of people who still don't, like, they, they order Bacardi and Coke or whatever, and, like, they mm-hmm. don't necessarily mm-hmm. know it, that it's rum. <laughs> Exactly. So it's like, I think they saved the category from falling off the cliff because after Punch fell out of favor and bars started moving to single serves, you know, gin was taking up a lot of market share. I think Bacardi was trying to formulate something that would compete in that market where there was more demand for, quote, light, clean spirits. Right. Right. But outside of that, it's like, what did people have? They had you know, Jamaica rums, which are a little too burly mm-hmm. to, to the cocktail templates at the time. And then that was basically it. So, hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's kind of ironic. It's like, oh, I don't know how to mix with Spanish rums, but Spanish style rums were the ones that were the first mixers in rum cocktails. So, yeah, no, it maybe- is. It is interesting. Um, and I mean, they're also many of them, as you said, are very approachable for people who are newer to it, um, which you would think would make them easy to incorporate into cocktails. Um, and I think they can be. But I, I think if you're going for more like complexity, like I, I find that those right. rums can get like a little buried in cocktails a lot. Right. Um, and as you, you were talking about, like, the, you know, the 50 percent and above can be helpful and that can sometimes be hard to find in that category. Um but yeah, it's such a wide category. And I think one thing John and I have talked about a lot is, you know, so often people just, you know, think, you know, big column still rum, no flavor. It's like not like, yes, a lot of the rums are lighter, but like it, it's it's not as simple as just saying like, they, you know, these rums are flavorful. These rums aren't flavorful. Um, I think mm-hmm. there's a lot more to the story than that. Um, although, yeah, it, 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 it is interesting. Like I think some of those brands you mentioned, I like that was surprising to me when you said that some of that is all just from the barrels that they use. Cause I've had those brands and it definitely, you know, tasted like more than that to me. Um, but I also think that's part of the problem with the whole discussion of, of sweetening and rum is we use terms like sweetening or people say dosage and uh, it all just gets kind of lumped into this mental image of like all these brands are just like pouring, you know, sugar, packets literal of sugar, sugar into yeah. their rums, yeah. which like, isn't necessarily like the process that actually takes yeah. place um there's there's like different approaches to how that happens but anyway yeah that that category there's a lot going on in it and i think it gets oversimplified a lot in especially with like you know nerdy rum conversations yeah shannon there's a yeah go ahead i'm sorry you can respond what's thing to say i just think that you know i was kind of guilty of this you know spanish rum kind of gets a bit of a bad rap Mm -hmm. (laughs) but um it's something that I, I want to spend my time kind of revisiting and uh, getting a a better understanding of and to not be as dismissive, right? Yeah. Because, you know, I think a lot of purists. Yeah. I won't yeah. The, the, air qu- the air quotes came up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mega you know what I'm talking about? They're, they're yeah. like, wow. Yes. It's not a pure single rum, so ooh, uh-huh. it's okay. that's. Mm-hmm. I'll just, I'll stop that. Leave I'll it at that. <laughs> you can't please everyone all the time, right? <laughs> um, so Shannon, there's a fairly new show on Netflix called Drink Masters, which is a competition of professional cocktail makers, mixologists. I wanted to ask you, have you seen this yet? Are you familiar with it? And if so, what are your thoughts on cocktail competitions in general? Uh, it, are, do you have feelings that you're competitive when you're coming up with new drinks and you're wanting to see what everybody else is doing? Like, how, how did you respond to, to this show if you're familiar with it? 
I'm familiar with it. I didn't watch it because I don't consume mass media. Okay. Probably a good choice. I, yeah. I got TV 15 years ago. 15 years. Like, nice. Remember in a hotel, the ho- the TV is like right there and I, I never turn it on. I just. <laughs> you like throw it. a blanket over it just in case. <laughs> she doesn't even see it. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't watch a show. I saw it like trailers and I know some of the people that were involved in it. Okay. And we have various types of feedback regarding their experience. Um, I think that the impressions I got there was, you know, that they wanted a show, right? So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that a certain way and be presented a certain way for the camera. Mm. And we see the camera with Instagram too. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's like Madrid can look great, but it can be like whatever. I don't know. I just I'm not into the flash. I don't look at what other people are doing apart from like maybe on Instagram we get ideas from garnishes. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But when it the builds, I prefer to just kind of refer back to classics. You know, like before I I got involved in bartending you know i had the jerry thomas guide tom bullock's book you know uh, cocktail bill boothby you know i just feel like they had it figured out mm. there's probably not much more i could do mm-hmm. apart from using ingredients that i have access to that maybe they didn't have ready access to at the time or equipment that um we have now you know, by virtue of, you know, what chefs have done, I try right. to break and, and use my gut. But no, I'm not competitive with other mixologists because I have my palate, they have theirs. I have my experiences eating different foods or yeah. traveling places. So it's like, I can't, I can't compete with anybody. They can't compete with me. Right. I You're all doing speak. your own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, we influence each other, but I, I'm never like, oh, I would have missed the best menu of the <laughs> world's 50 best. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, they're like, you know, yeah. even when it's like tails, you know, I, I was able to win a pioneer award, but there's a cynical part of me that was just like, oh, they just need a black person this year. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I just like they need a black person. Okay. okay. How 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 do you I, like? I'm sure you run into that a lot. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of people are trying to strike. I, I don't know a balance, I guess, between um, bringing more diversity to the table, mm-hmm. elevating voices that in the past you know weren't uh, elevated or even suppressed in some cases. Um, but then there are times where it you know, comes off as almost like a corporate, like checkbox coming off. Like, how do you, how, how have you navigated that? I'm sure it's extremely frustrating. I mean, I take it with a grain of salt because, you know, my, my goal in all the jobs I've had was just to be the best bartender in that bar, give the best service to guests, Mm. make best experience for people that I was working with and serving and that's all I wanted. And so the awards and the accolades are kind of like cherries on top. You know, I was never like very careerist about it or being like, oh, I have to work in this bar and work at this team and, you know, get in with people. I just didn't care at Uh all. And to this point, I still feel like a bit of a maverick because I'm just like, hey, I, I make weird drinks. (laughs) <laughs> and people want, and that's cool. That's enough. So, I, I, this this makes my next question even more interesting because now I know you don't watch TV, but you were recently <laughs> on it. <laughs> so, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I I saw this recent uh, CBS morning show uh, piece that they did on rum, and you were interviewed as part of that. And um, my first thought was they the first question he asked you was about pirates. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> I, I thought you handled the question very well, of course. Uh, and it led to more questions about history of rum. You were able to pivot. But I wanted to ask, what was your thoughts on that interview? Were you secretly saying to yourself, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? Or how did it go? I mean, it was fun. Vlad is a lovely individual. And we were taping at Miss Lily's in the count that, you know, I popped up in before, been a guest in before, and really great crew. So, I mean, the pirate question is just like, oh, why? But <laughs> I think that's a little perception. It's like Robin pirates. And it's like, I don't understand why we have this hang up over the category and we just yeah. refuse to acknowledge the quality of um, production that you see mm -hmm. realms that I believe have influenced other categories in regards to the use of pot and column cells in combination, varying um, maturation in blending methods. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, it's like people want to look down on well, like it's like the bastard stepchild. Yeah. But on the forefront of a lot of technology that other categories have utilized to improve the quality of the liquid. Mm. I wish we could talk about that as opposed to pirates. It's like mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like I feel like the 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 success of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean and Johnny Depp really set us back, you know, in terms of that. <laughs> I'm not mad at I'm not mad at that, but there's more to it for sure. Yeah, that's no, true. Yeah, anytime I see like a you know something as mass media as CBS doing something on rum, right. I'm kind of like, I kind of, you know, I'll watch it out of curiosity, but I'm, I have like the lowest expectations <laughs> of how they'll handle it. And I had a similar reaction to John, like they started with pirates and I was like, Oh man. Um, but I like, I thought you, you did a great job. Like by the end of it, I was like, yeah. I was like, in terms of comparing that to how rum would typically be uh, presented to a, like a mass american audience like that um i felt like the average person coming away from watching that you know with with your piece i know they, they interviewed a, a few other people as well um but i feel like they come away with a much more accurate idea of rum than i was expecting when i went into it so i was like nice go shannon good job look i'm, I'm fighting for the category you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah Champion. there we go <laughs> <laughs> like don't disrespect this name okay <laughs> Um, and part of being a champion for rum is also bringing more education, right? Which is what you were doing then and and what I think hopefully all of us strive to do to, to help better the category. Um, I, I'm going to be blunt. I've had some successes and I've had some failures at trying to educate and bring people into this wide world of rum on my own. So I wanted to ask you, uh, as can you tell us or give maybe me an overall approach and a few tips on how you begin to educate those who really aren't into rum, but they're there physically with you. You can pour them something or you can do something with them. Well, what I discovered, you know, when I was in the early days of Gladys was that <clears throat> if I could get people to realize that rum is a very diverse and global category. And it's just something for everybody, depending on what you like, then we, we start there, right? It's like, if you mm -hmm. like, and you like food, there's a good chance we can find you a rum pairing that you like as well. Yeah. I, I know a lot of people who like food, so you're right. That's a good one. We can start there. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. So, you know, think about rum from a, a gasatory perspective mm, mm -hmm. and also think about it from like a, a culture perspective and it's the most fascinating category in that regard because you can tap into all kinds of experiences depending on where you've traveled or where your family is from what kind of food you like what kind of music you like like there's so many tie-ins and mm -hmm. so <clears throat> I, I think a lot of consumers only know rum due to lens of the Spanish style. Right. Which I especially I here in Miami, by the way. That's very much yeah. the case in Miami. Yeah. And I want to learn more about it, but I think that that Spanish style kind of comes across as a little one dimensional mm -hmm. and not as rich. But it's like, well, there's more to it rum than that. 
Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, don't want to store it on your bus, but it's like, hey, if you're in the cognac, you know, an eggs agricole, if you close your eyes, mm. can cause like a really nice VSOP cognac. Yeah. Mm. Um, or an unaged, um, let's say, cane spirit can come across like a, you know, like a grappa. Mm, mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then, of course, there are different rums that come across, like whiskeys or single malt scotches. Yeah. You know, it basically has everything. Yeah. So I, I like to just point out that, hey, there's so many different types. Some people find it confusing, but I, I see that as a, a positive attribute because the diversity, the flexibility of the liquid, it's unmatched. Yeah. So what you're telling me is I have to buy more bottles for my home bar. <laughs> to have more options to then ask these questions and boom, I'll put it in front of them. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Buy, buy more rum is always the answer. <laughs> yeah. When, I, when I'm tasting, like when I, when I do seminars, I taste wine. I don't want people to be biased by labels or perception and just like mm-hmm. encounter the liquid on its own and, you know, mm-hmm. talk about production and how the impacts, um, the flavor and experience and stuff like that. Um, uh, but yeah, I, mm-hmm. there's a part that feels frustrated that people are kind of opposed to rubber, not really get it. But then there's a part of me that's like, well, that's more a good run for me. <laughs> that's one way to look at it. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, there are people like fighting over bottles of Pappy and stuff. And it's like, I don't yes, think yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think they away. Yeah. I don't know. That's true. Oh, you've never heard of Agricole? Darn. <laughs> yeah no totally i mean we we talk about that john and i a lot about because i mean part of why we do the show is like we want more people like we want to spread the word about rum you know um but it, there could be a double-edged sword to that because obviously we want the the producers who are doing this amazing work creating these you know amazing liquids to yeah. uh like i feel like it deserves a bigger audience um but you know then that that brings uh you know the 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 bigger spirits companies out there and then you know it becomes a a lot about the economics and driving out Mm -hmm. as you know creating as much scarcity as possible and you know i live in nashville i've seen a lot of the bourbon craze and stuff and uh, i mean we have people coming to us all the time saying like oh yeah like, like i just started listening to you guys i got into it because I'm a whiskey drinker and I just like got tired of i could never find my favorite stuff and i'm like yeah yeah that's awesome um I hope that doesn't happen here, but yeah. So yeah. Anyway, um, you you've told the 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 story many times of kind of how you got deep into rum by open, like designing the bar program at at Gladys back in I think it was 2014. Um, and I, I know you've gone on to do a lot of other bar programs since then. Um, one thing I'm interested in is like when when I think of a bar program as someone who you know, is a spirits enthusiast, but I've, I've never worked in a bar or anything like that. Um, you know, I think about the menu, I think about the way the drinks look, you know, the ambiance and everything, but what, what goes into a really great bar program that the average patron would never really consider or, or think about? I think the most important thing is that the team that's working in the establishment is focused on great hospitality first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. it's like, if somebody is serving you with a shitty attitude, it's not going to taste good. Mm. It doesn't matter. You know, like, I used to be really hung up on recipes and technique, and that's good to have. But the first and foremost concern should be that mm. the operators are treating the team in such a way that they're feeling inspired and uh, engaged and they want to convey that to the guests they really like being there and they want to make sure that everybody that comes to the door feels the same way and gets to experience what's good about the place right so it's like yeah yeah it's it's about hospitality that's a, the the number one ingredient mm-hmm and do that's you, good to hear because I'm good at that. So I, I can, I think I could walk into just no, and no. learn learn how to make drinks now. Yeah, <laughs> maybe if someday I can fix the get the other part all in in line, uh, uh, we can we can have something going. 
<laughs> um, all right. So as uh, Shannon, as someone who travels and consults with bars across the country, um, have you been in a position to note any regional preferences within the U.S. for how people prefer their cocktails or what they tend to prefer? I mean, I guess obviously here in South Florida, as we kind of already alluded to, there's a heavy uh, Latin American population and, and many culturally diverse people here. But in other parts of the country, it's going to be different. So have you noticed that as you've consulted with people? Well, one major distinction I noticed is that I think on the West Coast, in California in particular, uh, there seems to be a little more interplay between kitchen in bar, in regards to mm. the use of you know, ingredients. And then on the East Coast, in New York in particular, I think cocktails tend to be a little more spirit focused, a little boozier. Uh, it's cold. It's cold over there. You know, you got to get, you got to get through the winters. You need the strong, stronger drinks. Yeah. yeah. I think it's the weather, you know, and just the, the way people consume. Uh, Midwest, I think um, the palate can skew a tad sweeter or bitter. Interesting. And then as far as the South goes, I think it, it's a little fruitier. Mm. And some huh. people are using as modifiers. Yeah. You know, sweet tea, lemonade, mm. you know, yeah. those are less of a palate. Yeah. I think they kind of slide their way to the cocktails as well. As a follow up to that, who who do you think is making the best cocktails in the world right now? Other than you, of course. <laughs> um, well, I'm a big fan of Julia Momos. I mean, she's based in Chicago and uh, runs a bar at Kuniko. Okay. And is also located on Starbucks Reserve. Wait, what is Starbucks Reserve? So Starbucks Reserve has bar programs where they're using coffee and bitter aperitivo. Oh, okay. Really? And she designed, I don't know all the locations, but I know she at least at Chicago's locations uh -huh. and maybe more. Um, I have to say, I've had the opportunity to meet a number of influential individuals. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was in the presence of Julia at her bar, I was just like, just don't say anything. Just be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Just... Yeah. What, what what was it about about her approach that that kind of that kind of uh, put you under that spell? Well, I mean, I I think I just got the impression that there's very meticulous attention to detail and a concern for quality that a lot of people have, but it's just permeates the air mm -hmm. the only establishment you know from the way you're greeted at the host station to how you're led to your seat and every interaction i was just like oh my god i can't believe it. it's like you know you know what i'm saying like i'm not a stranger to the game like i've had an opportunity to yeah consult for rainbow room uh -huh, uh -huh. and you know interact with dale de yeah or you know hang out at clover club and have Julie Ryder at a guest at my pop-up, mm. you know, but I was just like, I'm going to go around my camera. She's like, this is like, okay. It's like, sorry. <laughs> just <laughs> listen, listen as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what did you say the name of her bar in Chicago is again? Kumiko. Kumiko. Okay. Add Kumiko, that to my right? Chicago list. Um, what what is something most home? I was going to say home bartender. That's probably not even the right uh, name to use. Someone who is not a professional who's making cocktails at home. What's something that most people don't do in those situations that you think would immediately make many of their drinks taste better? Maybe something an aspect they're not considering, um, or or anything like that. Yeah, I think that <laughs> maybe like the two biggest things is like. Fresh juice. Yeah. And ice. You know, so um, mm -hmm. I'm not 
talking about like has to be clear eyes, but like, you know, pay attention to what part of your season your eyes is in. Like I have, I'm answering one, but I have two refrigerators in my apartment. Okay. Well, one fridge out and the management company let me one and they never picked it up. <laughs> well, <laughs> So you're like, okay. sweet. <laughs> well, I feel like well, you have you have you have no TV, so it's only fair that you get there two you refrigerators. Go. Exactly. <laughs> well, fridge is just like a ice fridge for cocktails. Nice. It's no yeah. food in that freezer. And it's just ice in glassware. That's and awesome. then fridge is like where I keep samples and wine and a pair of tea from some of like that. But yeah, like the ice, because if the ice smells like whatever is in the freezer with the ice, yeah, you're going to the drink. Yeah. So, mm. you know, if you can isolate it or keep it in the bed or do you something, isolate it. Drink, you know, <laughs> ice yeah. Sorry, so I could not oh, pass man. that one up. I oh, apologize. Well, I have to get one dad joke in. I right distancing. Um. <laughs> yeah. Ice distancing. I like it. <laughs> um, so one thing we haven't really talked about yet, but that I know you spend a lot of your time with is you're integrally involved with both women leading rum and women who tiki, which you founded in 2018. Um, can you talk a bit about both of those efforts and where they are now and where they're leading? Yeah, I can talk about women who tiki because I just sure. popped up last night. Um, that came together very organically. I was um, planning to promote my book ahead of this launch. And uh, when I was at the venue, which is now closed, unfortunately, due to COVID, mm -hmm. I realized that um, Danny DeLuna, who's home bar girl on Instagram, lived across the street. And I was like, oh, wait. Nice. I was like, okay, well, can I bring Danny in to help me with this so we can like collaborate? And then as she and I were talking about the event, I was like, wait a minute. You know, the other week I was hanging out with Chelsea at Mother Pearl and we made this really cool cocktail called Warrior Princess. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I popped up at this other venue with Taylor Smurl. And I was like, why don't we just make this a group effort and like have it be like a team thing, mm -hmm. like rock it out. And it was nuts. Um, there's something about the woman Tiki Papa. I, it's always fun. It's always books like if it's a ticketed event it usually sells out within like 15 minutes mm. and uh the the vibe is always like just like i don't know i think people are like oh my god woman who tiki that's great and i'm like okay well there's a lot of women who tiki i yeah. have to come up with this but still i think people are, are really encouraged and inspired by you know seeing a group of women working together and what they perceive is a male dominated field I don't see Tiki as male dominated at all, right? I mean, you, you look at people like Marie King, who's now taking over Donna Beach Cover. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, but people like it. And I, I like to say, you know, girls just want to have rum. And it, it's just a fun, catchy name. <laughs> you know, people dig it. And what I have enjoyed about it is, you know, giving bartenders a platform to you know run a drink that maybe they can't run at their bar because it might be a little labor intensive but because mm. it's only light you know they can basically kind of go all out with it and i don't know it's, it's always super fun yeah i feel like i left uh miami one day uh sooner than i should have because i missed the i missed yeah. the pop-up that would have been great um I know I, I want to talk a little bit about what's next uh, for you. you. You've talked about some of the the projects you're working on, um, the rum you mentioned. But uh, one of the things I loved in your book, um, there's a little anecdote where you talked about how when you were five years old, you jumped down a flight of stairs just to see what it would feel like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and basically, like you used it kind of a way of describing how you've been wired to kind of seek things that are different, you know, uh, unconventional. That's kind of been your approach to cocktails. So what's kind of the next uh, cocktail or flavor frontier for you? What are some things that you've been trying or experimenting with that uh, you think people maybe haven't seen very much before? Um, what are you excited about doing in the, over the next four years since we've been talking about the last four years? Yeah, I mean, um, 
And the thing I'm really excited about is getting more involved in product creation. Mm-hmm. You know, I did the RDD with Livewire and that went really well. Right. I got well coming out and I'm like, I want to do more of that. I want to, mm. I don't know that I necessarily want to, you know, help a brand like mm-hmm. in, the, in the same way that, uh, you know, Ian Burrell has done mm-hmm. with Old mm-hmm. I don't know mm-hmm. if I'm going to get that and right but i've been reaching out to distillers and looking for people that were to do you know special barrel picks or you know great one ups so i kind of would like to carve this space where i can consult on creating products for brands that maybe need a special expression or a limited expression mm-hmm. and then you know kind of see where that takes me because yeah i, I still make cocktail recipes but I've always been, you know, a spirit enthusiast first and foremost, because that's what, it, to me, the cocktail should be based on the spirit. Uh, so I want to get into that. Um, more education. You know, I'm about a third of my time currently is spent on devising educational materials we're giving live seminars and yeah. I really love like the, the past couple of seminars I've been like it's you know just <laughs> I didn't want it I don't know if you guys like Van Halen you know that song Jump I'm like uh-huh, uh-huh. Then, you know, Duh, who yeah. doesn't know Jump <laughs> yes definitely I just feel like that you know when I'm presenting yeah. you know, that's that's my move right there nice what are what are the last few um seminars or like presentations that, that you've done that you feel like that was amazing. Like that went really well. Like you're feeling that jump vibe. Yeah. Um, kind of semi was like September last year. I gave a seminar with Dens and Rob in Long Island at Coastal Kitchen Bar. Oh, cool. It's kind of big. That was like maybe 50 bartenders. And typically, wow. you know, my classes have like maybe 30 people because I, I like it to be interactive with people, you know, feel comfortable to talk and comment and yeah. but yeah no it was a big room and i was like feeling really on fire and i had to do this thing and then like jump on a plane and you know go to San just go like a couple hours after that mm. uh but it was cool, cool. it was really yeah. cool and i recently did one at uh tiki chick in med hat also pretty cool a little more intimate that was mm-hmm. what runs like, from the book but I feel like I've kind of hit my stride in regards to my presentation style um, and still getting myself room to learn more about product and get excited too. Like, you know, doing it was the Kappa seminar. I was like, oh shit, I had this all wrong. And mm-hmm. I admitted it, you know, to the class. And mm. uh, it was, it's cool. Yeah. Um. I'm well, glad to hear I'm not the only one who gets things wrong once in a while, you know? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, before we move on, I have to say, I know, I saw what you did there, Shannon. You brought the jumping down the stairs all the way back around with Van Halen's jump. Nicely done. Go. Yeah. I don't want Rick to go with me. I, I mean, I don't think I'm a loose cannon, but I remember between like the ages of five and six, I was really determined to go to Japan to study the jitsu. Really? Oh. Which means no knives and forks. So it's only eating with chopsticks. <laughs> you, did, you did that as a five or six year old? That's I was great. like, I have to study. <laughs> Have, have you, you sound yeah we, we sound similar because i think i was indiana jones at that age and i was like i have to be an archaeologist and discover this crazy thing it sounds like we had the same childhood <laughs> i was just like i have to be ready and i have to be strong but they don't have knives and forks so i have to let it eat with chopsticks <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. laughs> have you have you made it to japan yet to, to begin your training well, i have not um i'm i've studied i've studied karate kung fu judo jiu-jitsu wow no way don't hmm. touch don't yeah i was gonna say so everyone you know watch out don't don't mess oh. with shannon um well shannon uh we have sort of a, a, a jujitsu portion of the podcast ourselves it's the end of the show we call our rapid fire round of questions so 
lots of things coming at you quickly. Exactly. Um, this this uh, segment is run by John. He's sort of the the mastermind behind this, the the master of ceremonies, curator, I guess you could curator. Say, the curator. Yeah. Um. So you know, we put sixty seconds on the clock. John runs you through a, a bunch of fast, rapid fire questions. Um, we always say it's optional, but no one's turned us down yet. So, but you know, it's, it's optional. If, if you're up for it, we can do that. I feel, I mean, you just talked about, you know, jumping down the stairs, all this. I feel like you're tailor made for this. Yes. Totally agree. She said, she didn't say yes. Okay. She said, bring it. Will. (laughs) okay. Awesome. Yeah. It it sounds good to me. Yeah. That's the attitude we like for this segment. So yeah. Um, John, I will get the clock ready. If there's any other details you want to provide. All right. No, Will, you got it. Just a uh, small answers as as fun or silly as you want to be with it, Shannon. Uh, and uh, we'll try to get through as many of these as we can in our roughly 60 seconds with Will as our unreliable timekeeper very roughly, as we very can. Roughly 60 seconds. <laughs> um, all right. If we're ready to go, uh, let's do it. I've got 60 seconds roughly and go. All right. Neat or on the rocks. Me. Column, pot or blend. Column. No, pot. <laughs> you had to think twice. All right. there. Uh, molasses or cane juice? What's your preference? Cane juice. Okay. And your favorite current rum mixed drink right now? That kitty. Ah, of course. Yes. All right. I'm going to try this. I don't know if this is going to work, especially since you, you said you don't consume mass media, but we're going to try it because <laughs> Star Wars has been around for a long time. I sincerely hope I'm not the first person to mention this, but your last name um, reminds me of an infamous planet name from Star Wars, Mustafar, where this is where Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi had their big battle in the fire and all this stuff. Does that ring a bell at all? Or are you like, am I totally off? And you're like, what are you talking about? I don't recall the name of the planet, but I do recall <clears throat> their battle. Okay, okay, good. There we go. All right. And you're familiar with Star Wars to some degree then. Okay. Yes. So what I wanted to ask you is, uh, since you know Star Wars a little bit, I'm thinking about what rum cocktail do you think they must have been serving in the Star Wars cantina in the original movie? This is the... Mai Tai. Mai Tai, Mai tai, tai for sure. I agree. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the perfect one. Okay. <laughs> and you came quick with it too. You were sure of it. All right. And what about when the... What rum should the rebel, rebels have been celebrating with after they blew up the Death Star? Okay, so they should be <laughs> writing with Appleton 21 year olds. Heck yeah. Can't go wrong. I love it. Excellent. I think Good it's a wonderful choice. Occasion, like saving, saving the universe. Yeah. <laughs> we spoke about modernizing cocktails, and you mentioned you have art history background. If this is the modern period with rum and tiki, um, are we going to have a postmodern period? Uh, you know, just like a tipped over coupe with a spent lime wedge or something? I think so. I mean, I, I think that. Um, I look at Tiki as a Baroque or Rococo phase. Ah, um, ooh. He's like, you know, Fragonard. Yeah. You know, a little bit of Boucher, you know, you know, all this color. And all this, I like, love it. Yes. Pastel. The pastel um, colors. Yes. Yeah, just like a lot of extra. Um, I think Postman and Tiki is when we like about like, you know, six ingredients in that. And maybe a little more spirit for it. Maybe a little more focused on the culinary techniques to like extract flavor. Mm. It's not like having so many items, just like fewer items, but like handled um, very deliberately in regards to how they're rendered and assembled. You've thought about this right. one a lot. I love yes. it. Yes. And, and finally, your favorite martial art discipline Aikido. Ah, <laughs> right. right. Excellent. Very nice. I'm, and I'm like a five five. And how do you And uh, what I learned is that it's just about timing your interaction with the assailant. And yeah. if you're fast, it doesn't matter how big they are. Right. You know, get under their center of gravity. And as a woman. I have a lower center of gravity. Mm-hmm. So advantage there. Like I can't punch anybody out. I have no illusions about that. But but if, mm-hmm. if you swing at me and if I catch you and toss you across the room because I capture your momentum, you might decide that you don't have a deal with me anymore because it's too much trouble. That's right. Gotta be nimble. I love play it. to your strengths. Yeah. Excellent. Every, every everyone listening now now knows 
a new a skill set that you have that they did not know before. Right. So yeah. don't mess with Shannon. Exactly. You don't want uh, this. <laughs> Uh, well, Shannon, this has been really fun. Thanks for taking the time uh, out of your day yeah. to hang out with us. Um, before before we go, um, wh- where's the best place for people to keep up with with everything you're doing? How can they find you? Best place is Instagram. Just my first and last name, All Shannon right. Westerberg. I don't have a handle. I'm like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh we'll put links to that in the show notes so everyone go check it out we'll put a link to your book in there as well uh if you don't have it go definitely check that out as well but uh shannon must for thank you so much for educating us not only on cocktails and rum but also the finer points of martial arts it's been great <laughs> right arm well, well john it was a pleasure to hang out with you guys and get my monday off to a good start <laughs> awesome um, yeah Hopefully we get to meet in person and, and yes. have them again. I know. Yeah. yeah, we 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 said before you mentioned we were like ships ships passing in the night uh in, in Miami <laughs> just now. So um I, I threw out there I think that's a great cocktail name. And you know, since you start with the name, I feel like maybe maybe by the time our paths cross, there we have go the recipe all worked out and we can uh we can toast with that. That might be fun. I can get started on that. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks, Shannon. Uh, again, it was great to have you. Really appreciate it. Right on. Okay. Take care, guys. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of the Rumcast. If you want to check out more with what Shannon is doing. If you want to look at her book, order a copy. If you haven't done that yet, we got links to all that in the show notes. So be sure to check it out. And if you got any ideas for your own cocktails, or maybe you thought of some great cocktail names throughout, maybe mm-hmm. for that um, cocktail 10 years in the making that Shannon said that she's working <laughs> on, be sure to send us an email, host at rumcast.com, H-O-S-T at rumcast.com. Or you can always message us on social media. John, where can they find us there? You can find us at Instagram at The Rumcast. You can also go to Facebook and find us there at The Rumcast as well. Um, We post on Twitter. We don't do that much on Twitter, but we post there. So you can find us on any three of those platforms. Give us a DM. Leave us a comment. Like Will said, if you've got a cool recipe, uh, let us know. Or maybe if you have a recipe for the perfect rum event that you also want to do, like we did in the intro, uh, tell us what that looks like for you and, and see. We'd love to. Whether you've been to a rum event or not, what in your mind constitutes that perfect rum event for you we would love to hear more so yeah give us your feedback let us know and hey if you want to hear more about the miami rum congress will where can they go to 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 do that they could go to patreon.com slash the rumcast that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash the rumcast so on patreon we're doing bonus episodes every month this month we're going a little bit more into detail about some of the rums we tried at rum congress we are doing monthly happy hours which are always a blast to have with the rumcast community and uh you also get your episodes a little bit early kind of early access a little private feed on there so um if you're interested in any of that uh head to patreon.com slash the rumcast we always uh, appreciate support there but john until next time (laughs) 